My name is Lewis McClellan, I'm the editor of the Digital Monetary Institute, and I'm delighted to be joined by Oliver Berger, head of the Middle East and North Africa for State Street. Today, we're going to be talking about the topic of data governance in central banks. Having spoken to a lot of central banks about this topic, it's something that really wasn't hugely on their radar a few years ago, but the complexity and the volume of the data that they've been gathering has increased very dramatically over the past few years with each different division and department having to collect data on their own initiative. Without a broader institutional framework governing how this how this data was collected, they ended up with a very organic approach, which suited each individual user at the time, but became quite unwieldy and, and caused some inefficiencies for the institution as a whole. So we've got Oliver to, to discuss those topics in a little bit more detail. Um, Oliver, can you tell me a little bit about how central banks are approaching their data transformation process? Hey, Louis, thank you. And first of all, thank you for having me on the podcast on, on this subject. So let me just answer your first question. Data transformation has really been an evolutionary process for institutional investment firms. Technology and innovation has taken hold and is creating a range of new possibilities and breakthroughs at many levels. But with this comes increasing demands. So really taking a step back, I think the financial crisis was the first catalyst for the use of big data by central banks. During that period of intense market volatility and stress, central bankers found that the data sets and models they were using to support decision making were inadequate. The data was stale due to long lag times. It lacked granularity and was often quite linear. Since that time, we have observed central banks investing in their big data capabilities and progressively expanding the scope of data sets. They look for their analysis. So fast forward a few years and the global pandemic behind us. And today we see the central bankers exploring non-traditional data sources for their economic analysis. They are looking at unstructured data sets, including social media, sentiment data from media, press releases, and data from third parties, including mobility reports, internet searches, and uh, really other sources. In Japan, the BOJ are looking at internet advertising uh, when measuring inflation. In Europe, there's been a drive to use new micro-level data, such as online operations and trading platforms, mobile banking data, and records relating to security settlement and cash payments. Another area of increasing interest is incorporating ESG data into economic performance, financial stability, and asset allocation decisions. And we think in particular on that ESG data, we have seen central banks really going deep into local country data, which is a very difficult task to harvest, really. At a macro level, we are also experiencing some fundamental economic shifts. Central banks are exploring new asset classes and investment strategies, and across the board, the widespread integration of ESG factors. Other shifts include changes to internal and external portfolio management and the operating model implications that this brings. Uh, to dive uh, deeper into uh, this topic, uh, we held a series of roundtables and interviews with key central banks across the globe to understand the challenges and opportunities around data transformation. The findings were interesting and uh, really covered the full spectrum. Interestingly, we found that many central bankers are now at an inflection point and very much starting to realize that an integrated data platform is critical to navigate these evolving changes whilst benefiting from scale, efficiencies, and build flexibility that the technology has to offer. Thank you, Oliver. Yeah, it's been really remarkable following this project with you guys to see that the extent to which central banks are in quite a rapid uh, period of change, very, a very dynamic time for the community. Can you talk a little bit more about the, the challenges that kind of emerged more recently now that they're ingesting, aggregating, analyzing such a broad range and volume of, of economic and investment data across several different functions? Yeah, I mean, it's really simplifying the data environment is one of the biggest problems uh, central banks face. While there's more data available than ever before, they still struggle with data ingestion, data integration, and accessing golden source data in a format that can be used for analysis. Traditional technology platforms were built with a focus on storing rather than consuming data. So legacy platforms add to these complexities. Now, breaking this down a little further, the reality is that the sheer 
volume of data can be very overwhelming. In addition to this, unstructured data and streaming data present further complexity in extracting usable insight for making investment policy and risk decisions. In addition to this, unstructured data and streaming data, and on streaming data in particular, you know, if you're bringing in very large volumes of data from live sources such as markets, that presents further complexity in extracting usable insights for making investment policy and risk decisions. A fragmented and, and silo data also pose a challenge. Aggregating and reconciling data from multiple sources is time consuming and complex. It also hinders timely decision making and increased costs. During our conversation with central banks, we found that many central banks operated without a government's framework of any kind. Each department would gather the data it needed in the format that suited their individual needs. Over time, this multiplier effect created an expense of different systems for managing data, widespread duplication of effort, conflicting or unverified data, and serious inefficiencies in data governance. And at times, when you look at operating models and data connections, it would rather look like a tube map than an affecting model, just to illustrate that a little further. Data delivery plays into this as well. This is about getting the right information to the right people at the right time. During our research, we found that central banks were tackling this with very different approaches. One central banker discussed of how they were improving data share and collaboration with a data sharing initiative. Having better visibility across their data has allowed them to make linkages that were not apparent in the past. Without the infrastructure to facilitate data flowing easily from department to department, it is likely that some teams within the central banks will be working from incomplete statistical pictures. Multiple versions of the same information will, in most cases, create confusion that may differ on specific points, or perhaps one has been updated more frequently than the other unless there are rigorous controls to ensure there's a single golden copy. The collection of multiple versions can lead to analysis based on imperfect information. Yeah, thank you, Oliver. It's a much more serious challenge than it first appeared when we first started looking into this, I think. And I think the good news is that a lot of central banks have been taking this problem very seriously and kind of working out a governance framework to, to ensure that, they, that they're not facing these challenges. Can you talk us through a little bit about the, the solutions, whether that's technology or, or business organization solutions that they're using to, to mitigate the challenges? Yeah, sure. I mean, there are many different ways that enterprises can adopt new technology platforms. I think there's a few key considerations for those embarking on that data transformation journey. Consolidating data environments and effectively streamlining business processes promotes collaboration and increased transparency within those firms. Open architecture platforms that support interoperability, and interoperability is really a key point here too and able to bring you know, great systems and existing operating models together with future operating models to have that really open architecture. And with a diverse ecosystem of third-party solutions that can really drive transformational value with their ability to deliver fit-for-purpose applications and services across the investment lifecycle. And then enterprise data management helps to streamline data by breaking down technological and functional silos, central bankers can capture and leverage data across the firm and then integrate these data sets to reduce operational risk, increase accuracy, and free up resource. We see the implementation of a suitable platform as the foundational piece. And then the real enabler for bringing these pieces together is around the supporting of data services, meaning that, you know, once you kind of brought the data together, you normalize the data, you enrich your data, that you extract maximum value in a professional way of, you know, the structure you have created. So if you think about this in the context of managing reserves, the enterprise data management platform enables the connectivity to draw data from various sources in a seamless manner. And then services layer uh, then helps to validate curate, govern, and create a master of the data. And ultimately, that's the key to being able to get real-time position data, visibility of risk at a firm-wide level to support investment decisions. 
During our discussions, the central bank has also spoke of the growing speed and velocity of data needed for statistical analysis. In the past, it was feasible for central team to serve the data needs of other departments as they rose, but it's no longer practical in most cases. Some central banks are now giving users the tools they need to harness this data in a flexible and easily to access format to create better outcomes. I think we will continue to see significant advances in data, technology, and platforms, and large institutions, including central banks, will need to keep pace. A large part of this will come down to how they integrate new technologies, data platforms, management tools, and so on, with a data-centric mindset. Yeah, it's been it's been incredible to hear about the the increasing expectations on on data services within central banks. Just a hugely more complex job uh, performed at a much higher pace than it, than it seems to be a few years ago. I wanted to ask you a little bit about the topic of the cloud. That's obviously a very important part of uh, the data governance story. And yeah, I'd be interested to to hear your thoughts on on how central banks are approaching that. Yeah, I think th- this is you know hard to go very far on a data conversation with the central bank without addressing the cloud. And every enterprise data management model will ultimately have some component of cloud. I think we have observed software vendors moving very rapidly from on-prem to cloud-based technology. So this will not be only relevant for data, but it will be relevant for a wide variety of software solutions. You know, back to the cloud, it, it offers significant benefits flexibility, transparency, scalability, and resiliency. But many central banks are wrestling with data sovereignty as they look to adopt cloud models. So cybersecurity is is clearly also of concern given their mandates uh, and what is at stake. We covered this topic through the research and found that some central banks are reaching somewhat of the middle ground. They're willing or able to allow some of their less sensitive data onto the cloud but would not be able to fully migrate to a public cloud because of the need to protect more sensitive data. So adopting more of a hybrid approach to cloud. Hybrid clouds are a mix of public cloud hosted on a multi-tenant infrastructure and private cloud hosted in on-prem infrastructure, offering a blended approach. This helps to enable the benefits of efficiency and tools offered within cloud without compromising on the security standards of storing sensitive data. So taking a look at how some are navigating this path more specifically, one central bank we spoke to said they were considering a model where data is stored in the cloud in an encrypted form. In this case, the data could be stored and shared efficiently for analysis, but the key for the encryption would be held separately by a third party. That would mean if the cloud provider was ordered to release data, would only be able to release encrypted data, ensuring the sensitive information remains private and protected. For central banks in the uh, European Union, the situation is a little more complicated. An EU committee is in the process of developing its own policy and guidelines around cloud deployment. And we're expecting a release of that in 2024. So while the adaptation of cloud is not without its challenges. Uh, We are optimistic that cloud technology will evolve rapidly and deliver significant benefits to central bankers in time. Yeah, thank you. It's it's really interesting to watch this process at central bank. They take quite a different view in comparison to the the private sector, which perhaps isn't a surprise, but they have a lot of the, the same challenges in common. Just to sum up then, um, we, we've talked a lot about different components of, of the data governance process and, and technology, but can you talk a little bit about how this all intersects, how it's all being put together on the ground? So I'm thinking about the process, the technology, and the people as well. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how that's implemented? In summary, you know, cloud, hybrid cloud technologies, a gold copy of data, data management, data management services, and creating operating model interoperability are the key drivers for central banks going forward. I would say in closing that a number of central banks we're talking to are planning to make their first steps towards hybrid cloud in 2024 and have already begun in choosing components of the future operating model, which natively migrate into a public cloud environment when they're ready to migrate. 
And maybe with the data encryption we discussed earlier, in order to start the journey to continue to be competitive in today's larger market environment, it is key that central banks can also use efficiencies which the broader market has access to in a cost-effective way based on the highest standards of data protection as they evolve on their journey to the cloud and managing data efficiently with a gold copy of data at the core of their future operating model. Excellent. Thank you, Oliver. Uh, it's a really interesting topic, certainly much bigger challenges with, with much broader implications than, uh, than we realized at the, at the start of the project. So delighted to, to have you here talking us through the research there. And I'm sure there'll be much more to discuss on this topic in the future. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, thank you, Louis. Thanks for having me today. Thank you for listening today. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you found today's podcast interesting, the report published alongside State Street will be available from April 27th. Thank you for listening. Do feel free to check us out on social media. We're on Twitter and LinkedIn, and the podcast is available on Spotify, Podbean, and on our website as well on, on Fifth On Demand. Thanks very much for listening. Goodbye.